want no oil. A spoil in my shoreline, I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things, a creeping and crawling, won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe Damar, and you have had the wonderful good fortune to tune into For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment, and we talk about them in the ways that they affect you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, the wealth and health and happiness of your family and the, the critters that live all around you and the plants and the animals and pretty much everything. And uh, we've got a, a great show lined up for you today. Uh, we have a recorded interview with a returning guest, Eric Weimer. Uh, Eric happens to be a f head fishery biologist with ODNR, Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And he's going to tell us all about the walleye run and, and give us some insights into walleye Fishing, fishing and walleye fish. Tell us a little bit about what, what they do with their days. What do those walleye do when they're not uh, actually getting fished? Uh, we'll be joined shortly by my co-host, Rebecca Wood. And she, in honor of uh, March being the Women's History Month, she has come up with a top five women environmentalist list, which should be interesting. And of course, we're going to have some hear from our wonderful, wonderful sponsors, starting uh, right after we hear from Eric Weimer. And then we've got some pretty intense environmental news for you, some ecological news and information that, uh, and we have, we have another scoop. I just wanted to report that once again, a story we covered last week uh, got covered by one of the quote unquote major news outlets this past week. So uh, either they're listening and going, oh, hey, they, they did that on Four Agree Future. We should report on that. Or they're just slower than us, <laughs> one or the other. But uh, so looking forward to talking with you folks for the next hour. And when I say looking forward to talking with you folks, I mean that literally because this is a call-in show. And we would love to hear from you, 866-240-1065. That's 866-240-1065. Anytime in the next hour. Well, except, of course, while Eric Weimer's interview is going. But uh, apart from that, any time in the next hour to talk about any environmental topic. And uh, one thing you might want to call in on is after we talk with Rebecca and get her top five women environmentalists, maybe you've got an idea that we missed somebody or there's, or you might have some, uh, might not like our, our choices for the top five. And... Also, the uh, walleye. Are you planning to go? Are you going to go fish walleye this year? Uh, according to the interviews, you'll hear it's a really great year for, for fishing walleye. And uh, it was a really great first day of spring yesterday, spring equinox. It was uh, just gorgeous out. The thermometer on my garage there uh, said 65 degrees was the high. Now that my cell phone... <laughs> And the official numbers that I've, I've seen did not say anything like 65. They said 
around 57 or 58. But I'm pretty confident that it actually was 65 here because we actually have two thermometers, one on the north side of the house and one on the south side, and they both agreed. And I often find that happens, that the, the actual measurement of temperature I'm taking at my house is a, often a lot warmer than the, than the official temperature listed for, for Bowling Green. And it just reinforces my belief that it, it always, whenever you can, take some measurements yourself, you know, take, get your own data. I mean, to just have to rely on the quote unquote official sources for everything. Sometimes the official sources are wrong. You know, sometimes it's just, they are just making mistakes in measurement or, or errors in uh, judgment or, and sometimes, sometimes it is deliberate. Like uh, I'm convinced that when uh, Fukushima happened 10 years ago, and all the radiation monitors on the West Coast just happened to be offline as that cloud of radiation crossed over uh, from the Pacific. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was that was on purpose. But uh, of course, could ever prove it. It's just an opinion. In a way, I'm accusing, but I'm, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying that's my personal belief and opinion. And so the point is, if you can get your own thermometer, get your own pH monitors, get your own, uh, I have a Geiger counter. I've got my own Geiger counter. If you want to find out, you know, where are they telling the truth and where are they off? You've got to be able to measure yourself. And I, I think that's a, an important thing. And it harkens back to the early days of the Republic when we had, uh, amateur scientists, you know, people, people like Benjamin Franklin, they would take their own measurements for everything, humidity, temperature, everything they could measure back then. And those measurements were respected because people, well, we didn't have this division to the degree that we've got today where we've got scientists, people who know incredible depth about science. And I, I love them and they're, I love having them on the show as interviewees because they're so passionate about it. But too much of that knowledge is segregated off into the scientists and not enough has come back into the general population to the, the quote unquote amateurs who uh, study science for the love of science and who can kind of take all that specialized knowledge and reapply it in a general way to what's going on in the, the rest of the world. And one of the places people do that, of course, is with their gardens. <laughs> we had, uh, actually, I am proud to say that first day of spring, spring equinox, we actually did some planting in our garden and we planted peas, which is a good early crop. And we planted them. Now this is much earlier than it's recommended to plant in uh, any kind of seeds right now, because not all quote unquote danger of frost has passed. But again, applying the general to the specific, we've been seeing with global warming that spring is coming earlier and earlier. And so even though this is so far above the official, so far ahead of the official planting date that most garden centers aren't even open yet around here, uh, we decided to take the risk and plant our peas super early because we think it's going to work. We think that the warm weather's coming. We don't think there's going to be any more snow. We think the peas that we planted on spring equinox are going to do just fine. So we'll see. Uh, and one other thing that I, I did in our, in our household <laughs> for spring equinox is we that spring cleaning bug really does seem to be a real thing. I somehow got it in me to like clean and vacuum the entire first floor of the house and don't quite know what came over me, but it's nice to have a, a clean and vacuumed house for, <laughs> for celebrating spring equinox. And did you do anything special for spring equinox? Did you enjoy that, that wonderful weather that around here anyway, around my house, it was at least 65 at one point. Uh, give us a call. Let us know what you did or didn't do for spring. 866-240-1065. And one reason I wanted to suggest that you get out in these sunny days is that uh, it's been shown that sun being out in the sun increases both serotonin, which is the happiness hormone, 
when you're happy, your body produces a lot of serotonin and serotonin is good for you in a whole bunch of ways. And uh, also, it's also a good producer of melatonin, which uh, helps you sleep. So getting out in the sun for a long time each day uh, both makes you happy and lets you sleep better. So, <laughs> which also often makes you happy. So, Rebecca, hi, how are you? I guess you're on the line with me now. I am, yes. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Yeah. So, did you guys do anything special on uh, Spring Equinox there? We kind of did. Uh, I went to the store and, and, uh, because it was a food stamp day. So, I, I got a Japanese mochi ice cream treat. Um, Ooh. which mm -hmm. are probably better when you get them before they have melted so that they're just kind of ice cream soup with weird gelatinous snail like lumps of dough in them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing. Yeah, probably. Yeah, that, that's yeah. a pretty good guess. Uh, well, that's nice. That's nice that you're, you got out at it and you went out for a, <clears throat> a walk there on, on Spray Go Knox and did... Uh, there you go. Did your co co host Koga there mark the day with any kind of special event? Well, gosh, I don't know. He um he got into an argument with the with the dog that was in the car with me, so that was kind of fun for both of them, you know. Ah, uh, okay. Well yeah, thanks. He's a big uh, tough doggy. Oh, and this week um we are both uh, myself and my roommate are both celebrating getting our COVID shots first round. Ah, congratulations. Oh, that's great. Thank you. It's pretty huh. exciting. Well, if I could manage to get mine at some point, maybe we could even go back into the studio. Who knows? <laughs> Heck yeah, that'd be great. I don't. Yeah. I guess things are bad there in Boring Green. We, um, we, we had to do some calling, you know, and then we had to scramble for transportation. I guess now there's going to be a program where... Uh, Tarda is going to schlep people out to Mwami or, you know, with with all the problems with getting communities of color to buy into the COVID shot, you'd think they could maybe put it downtown where, where it's on the bus routes, you know? Yeah. Huh. But so, no. <laughs> so for COVID, the our Toledo's mass transportation will, will sh ship people out to to places like Mwami, but... Huh, so they'll do it for that special occasion, but on a regular basis, it's not really that convenient or practical. Right, and you know, if you uh, if you had to, if you wanted to get it done in any way promptly, you had to arrange your own ride because that program was not up and running when the when the shot started. Uh, well, I think maybe we've had uh, people from Tarda on as guests before. I think maybe it's time to look them up again and see see what they're up yeah. to over there at Tarda. All right, it's well, not clear to me either whether you need to call in and register for a ride to the, the place or if you just go down to uh, Huron Street and catch the bus either. Ah, well, worth knowing. All right. And something else yeah. worth knowing uh, is, of course, that this is walleye season. And uh, we have a, a nice interview lined up. It's a recorded interview, so uh, you can call in after it's done uh, with Eric nice. Weimer. So, uh, Russell, would you go ahead and play that interview, please? Well, welcome to the show. Uh, if you could just share with our listeners your name and your position. Sure. Uh, my name is Eric Weimer. I'm the uh, supervisor at the Sandusky Fisheries Research Station uh, on Lake Erie with the uh, Division of Wildlife. All right. Thanks. And uh, the reason I called you today is because uh, right now down at here in Toledo area in the Maumee River, we've got a bunch of guys standing around in the river and uh, just curious, you know, why would they be doing that? And uh, I think you have the answer. Well, sure. Um, you know, this time of year is, uh, is when our uh, walleye run uh, typically starts. Um, walleye are, are moving into uh, shallow rocky areas out in Lake Erie, but also into some of the tributaries to the lake um, where they find good spawning habitat. Um, you know, the Maumee River and the Sandusky River are, are the two rivers here that receive most of the attention, but there are some other tributaries that get a few fish that, that run up them as well. Um, and so those lucky anglers are, are out there trying to uh, uh, catch themselves some, some walleye during this time of year when, um, when, when those of us that don't have boats can get access to some of those Lake Erie walleye. 
All right. So how does the walleye season look this year? Well, it, it should be um, really good. Um, speaking of, of the uh, Lake Erie walleye population in general, we have ha- um, we've been benefiting uh, for the last uh, six or seven years from really strong walleye hatches uh, in Lake Erie. Um, 2014 uh, to now have all been near or well above average and and uh, as far as the hatch strengths go and uh in fact we've had a couple of um record size hatches um our our couple of our our best hatches that we've ever had have come in the last few years um so especially uh we had a really big hatch in 2015 um, which is, you know, those, those fish from the 2015 year class are, are really driving what people are catching right now. Um, th- those would be kind of your, your 20 to 24 inch fish that, that people, um, are catching. And I believe that they made up, um, something like 70% of, of our harvest from last year, uh, were from that year class. Huh. But we've also got, um, uh, record hatch uh, from 2018 and, and 2019 uh, that'll be entering the fishery um, in the in the you know the 2018s will will be three this year so there'll be uh, a, most of them will be above that that 15 inch minimum size this year and and we expect that by the end of this season or or maybe early next season the 20 a uh, 19 year class will be uh, entering the fishery as well. So right now we're at really strong, high walleye population levels in Lake Erie. And so uh, our fishing has definitely reflected that over the last couple of years. Oh, that's that's great. So how long does the, the walleye run go? You know, it typically starts um, in mid-March, you know, like right now we're we're talking on the uh the 18th of march and um it it would it would definitely it has started to a degree it's still a little cold it's still a little early but there are fish in the rivers in fact we had a crew out on the sandusky river uh last week collecting some fish for some age and growth uh work that we're doing and uh and they were able to 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 catch some fish that were kind of staging below the spawning areas so uh it they're definitely in the rivers um but it's still early the the spawn really hasn't quite started yet we would expect in most years that uh decent walleye fishing during the spawn extends through the month of april it usually winds down by the beginning of may in the rivers especially Okay, so it's definitely now's the time to get in on it if you're if you're going to do it. Uh, you've got some weeks ahead of you. Yeah, sure, and I think I think we typically see our our peak uh, river fishing is is usually the the f- around the first week of for second week of of April, depending on which river and depending on you know how the the weather conditions vary year to year but it, it, we usually see that peak is still uh, we're still a couple of weeks off from the the best numbers of fish in the rivers but uh, it certainly is worth the effort now if you if you have a, a, an itch to get out all right well i was wondering if this year because this is the the second year you've been on thanks for mm-hmm. coming on again i was wondering if we could sort of place the walleye in terms of like the food web, uh, what what do they eat? What things eat them? Uh, how do how do the other species in the lake, like uh, the minnows and the perch, fit in with the walleye uh, life cycle? Sure. In Lake Erie, um, I mean, we we typically think of walleye, uh, at least adult walleye, as being kind of the the top of the the food chain here, the the key predator. Uh, at least in in most of Lake Erie, um, there are other species of fish that that are you know kind of keystone predators in the lake as well, um, but they're, they're perhaps not as abundant, uh, and they're certainly not something we see much of in Ohio. Uh, so, like for example, um, lake trout are are a, a key uh, predator as well, 
but the, most of the year they're limited to um, the colder, deeper water in the eastern basin of Lake Erie and, and sometimes in the central basin. Uh, and, and their numbers don't don't approach the the population size of of our walleye fishery so our walleye population um so you know while there are other are other predators out there um just based on both their behavior and um and just the sheer numbers of them walleye tend to be kind of our our key predator in lake erie so i mean a walleye uh, adult walleye will uh, feed on a variety of different things a lot of the time, it's it's based on um, what's available uh, to them um, and and where they are in the lake. Um, so, what we typically see from diet work early in the summer or early in the spring, rather, um, is that they will eat a variety of different items. Um, pretty much what's available to them uh, early in the year. So, I mean, that might be. Um, yearling gizzard shed from the previous year it, it might be um some white perch um it, it it might be just about anything that they can find we've we've even on a, a rare occasion found uh, you know an eight to ten inch freshwater drum in uh in a walleye diet in the spring uh, and that's mostly because they have fewer options uh in the spring um, the, the, the hatches of forage fish haven't occurred yet. So, uh, they kind of have to make do with what they can find. We do find some invertebrates in their diets, especially like during the mayfly hatch. But once you get into kind of, um, summer to late summer, um, you know, we see some emerald shiners. Um, we see, uh, especially for adult walleye that have moved into the central basin, um, where it's a little deeper and cooler water, we see uh, rainbow smelt becoming a pretty important uh, forage item too. And, and the further east you go, you get down into New York waters and, and rainbow smelt are really a, a driver there. Um, we also see some some uh, evidence of them feeding uh, on the bottom of the lake. So we see some gobies in their diets. And then by, by the time you get into fall, uh, that's usually when they're they're really trying to pack on the pounds before winter gets there, so that they can you know finalize uh, egg development and things like that. And so we we really find them keying in a lot on uh, gizzard shed, uh, young a year gizzard shed. By that point, are are in the three to five inch range, and those giant schools of gizzard shed are are just a buffet for for hungry fall walleye. Um, so that's kind of what we see. We, we do see other species, uh, in their diets, especially when forage numbers are low. Um, so, and as, as most of your listeners may know, um, emerald shiner numbers have been, uh, fairly low for a few years now in the lake. And so we do see other species that, that enter into walleye diets, um, including, uh, young a year yellow perch when, when they're, they're the most abundant. Um, we see some white bass and white perch. Uh, we see some other oddities such as, you know, silver chubs or trout perch that are species of fish that we, we rarely see in their diets. Um, but, but when forage abundance is low, we see them utilizing those species as well. So, uh -huh. so they'll, they'll eat most every, anything, although they do have some, some preferences, some favorites. They, they certainly, I mean, just like any other fish, um, they would much rather eat a soft raid gizzard shad or emerald shiner or rainbow smelt than trying to have to deal with the spines of a yellow perch or a white perch or something like that. Ah, well, makes sense. And they don't mind the uh, the warmer temperatures we have down here at the western end of the of Lake Erie. It, it really it does vary a bit. So um, larger fish, uh, larger walleye tend to prefer cooler water temperatures, and so that's why we see uh, pretty major migrations in Lake Erie throughout the year. Whereas the 
they're all down here. Many of the, the walleye are in the western basin during the spring because of the great spawning habitat we have. Um, usually post spawn, you start seeing those, those adult fish start to work their way east. Uh, and, and usually by the time we get to summer weather, uh, the, the adult fish have worked their way down to, um, eastern Ohio waters, Pennsylvania, and even down to New York waters of Lake Erie. Um, the younger fish, the smaller fish, um, tend to not move quite as far uh, and and will stick around in the West Basin for a, a lot longer uh, in the summer than, than the old, bigger older fish do. They they have some different temperature tolerances that, that make them uh, able to do that. Uh-huh. So uh, does anything besides humans eat the walleye or like uh, do eagles eat the walleye for example you know I, I don't know that eagles will ever be actively fishing for walleye um if if they find you know a, a a dead walleye they will certainly pick it up and eat it um really i mean if you're talking about predation on walleye um, you're talking about either a really large predator like uh, a muskie or maybe even a northern pike. Um, they might grab a, a, a walleye that is, you know, 14, 15 inches long. I, I, you, they definitely have – it'd have to be a big muskie or big pike in order to uh, eat a walleye that's any bigger than that. Um, smaller walleye like the um, – you know, juvenile size, you know, anything from the, you know, fresh out of the egg larvae up to, you know, like a yearling size fish that might be 10 inches or less. Uh, there's probably other uh, predators out there that, that would definitely feed on those. I mean, the smallest ones can be eaten by, you know, white perch or, or yellow perch or um, white bass. Um, in the rivers, we, we think a lot about um, catfish as being a predator uh, in, in these rivers, both uh, channel catfish and flathead catfish. Uh, and then there's other other predators that can eat real small um, fish prey, you know, like freshwater drum and, and other species. So there are definitely predators of walleye, although most of those predators are going to feed on them at really young, small sizes. All right. So, okay, so now, but there's some potential threats, correct? Uh, we're hearing a lot in the news about the uh, the snakehead fish from Asia. Uh, do, or do they pose a threat to the walleye? So any invasive species that gets into Lake Erie is going to uh, kind of disrupt the food web. Um, and so, you know, any anything that gets in here is going to cause uh, its own problems. Even, you know, we've seen how... Lake Erie's been altered by the introduction of uh, zebra and quagga mussels, um, brown goby. Um, you see how uh, a lot of people are, are talking about Asian carp and grass carp and the potential uh, impact that they could have on the food web. Uh, northern snakeheads are, are certainly a concern. Um, right now, those northern snakeheads are, are mostly found uh, in the Maryland, uh, Eastern Virginia, um, New Jersey, uh, coastal states. Um, and there is the threat of them kind of working their way, uh, into other systems. There have, there have been some, you know, the occasional, um, single fish that, that gets found in other locations. I think in 2019, there, there's a record of, one being found in the Pittsburgh area, um, but not certainly not a population of them. And those things can can you know also be released from aquarium trade and things like that. So um, we don't know exactly how they're going to spread. Um, they are a predator. Um, I, th I think a lot of people uh, kind of equate them with uh, like. Uh, like a, a big largemouth bass. I mean, they're they're a little more toothy, but I think as far as the the, the forage that they feed on, um, it would be like adding another um, predator like that in into the lake. You know, right now, 
they're not exactly uh, banging on our door uh, step uh, to Lake Erie. Um, so it's something that we are, are watching and we are concerned about in the future. Um, but they're, they're not the, you know, the intense Imminent. concern that right. like Asian carp are right now. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much, Eric. It's been great. Uh, any last words of advice to anybody who's considering getting out there and trying to catch one of these? You know, I, I think right now is is uh, a great time to, to be getting outdoors and, and picking up some fishing if you have never done it before. Um, our our uh, daily bag limit is six fish, regardless of whether you're in the lake or whether you're in one of the tributaries to, to Lake Erie, as long as you're within the the defined Lake Erie Sport Fishing District, uh, which is downstream of that first dam that's on the rivers. Um, it's a six fish bag limit this year and uh, 15 inch minimum size. And uh, it's great fun and, and, and definitely give it a shot. Wow. So if you manage to catch 10 or six of the 24 inch fish that's like 10 feet worth of fish there that you can bring home <laughs> it's a it's a it's a heavy cooler we'll put it that way <laughs> all right well thanks so much eric my pleasure it's very nice to be able to have a story about a healthy population and a and a strong fishery i mean you heard him this is a we're at near record levels for walleye so you could get out there and, and fish without any you know environmental qualms you're not going to be hurting the walleye population by taking it and that's a very important point that we make over and over again in for a green future is that once once we take in stock the actual numbers the population once we make sure that the nat natural populations are healthy then we get to enjoy the abundance <laughs> You, you heard, Eric, this year that the bag limit is six fish a day. And, of course, I did the math wrong on the fly there. If you catch six of those 20-inch walleye, that's 12 feet worth of fish you can bring home. And that's a pretty significant amount of, uh, of fish. You could add quite a bit to your diet that you don't have to go to the store for. In fact, my wife has told me this year she wants me to get out there and catch some walleye. So I've actually never personally done the walleye fishing before, but it looks like this is going to be the year for it. So uh, looking forward one to that. I'll things, let you know how it goes. Go ahead, Rebecca. What, one of the things that I was sort of cool and culturally unique about Toledo, I've noticed besides having herons in the downtown, uh, we have fishermen in the downtown pretty much chronically anytime you go for a walk down by the lake or by the, by the river, by the Maumee, um, Mostly men, mostly black, both sides of the river. You see them in promenade and also in international. And, uh, yeah, there's just, there's always somebody, you know, there's this whole populist subculture of guys who, who, and, and some women who just spend a lot of their free time, all of their free time that they possibly can fishing down by the Wami River, mostly in downtown. And, uh, I've noticed something. They get along real well with the geese. You know, you, if you see dust stops between people and geese in the parks, you know, it's some idiot who's just riding through and gets all hysterical and has to challenge the geese, you know. The, the fishermen and the geese understand each other. and They just kind of, you know, they have a little negotiation, you know. They'll just kind of walk by and like, okay, excuse me, going to the water now. And, they, you know, maybe there's a little kiss and then they keep going. And, uh... <laughs> It's kind of fun, uh -huh. you know, you you walk through there and there's usually somebody, you know, with a styrofoam cooler playing some soul music. It's nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's true that animals do have the ability to recognize individual humans. You know, they, they can... Right. I don't know if they come up with, you know, animal names for us, but uh, but they could definitely yeah, say, oh yeah, it's, it's that person, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, well, so now that we've heard from Eric, it's time to hear from our sponsors. Four Greed Features brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead people on outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every single day of the year. 
And there's a whole bunch of ways to find out what they're doing and what kind of fun things they're they're having because they've always got programs going. Uh, one is to call them at 419-353-1897. That's 419-353-1897. You can go to their website, of course, wcparks.org, and you can download their app. You go to any app store. It's a free app, and you just search for WC Parks. And, of course, look for them on social media like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and so forth. That's the Wood County Park District. And Four Green Futures also brought to you by our fantastic patrons. These are people who have signed up. They've gone to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and uh, chosen a monthly membership level where they can uh, just make a small contribution, comes out of their paycheck, comes over into ours. And uh, the more people that do that, the smaller the monthly contribution could be. <laughs> uh, but they definitely help keep us going and Please uh, join them. Become one of our patrons at patreon.com and just search for For A Green Future. Okay, Rebecca. So, as you know, it's March is Women's History Month. And, of course, we have to put our ecological spin on it. I understand you have a list of the top five women environmentalists. Okay, I'm looking at this, and for some reason, I only have four. One, two, three, four. Um, I don't okay. know what happened to five. <laughs> All right. Well, we forgot five. I'll... Okay. All right. So, yeah, in consultation with Joe, we developed this list, which may be controversial. Call in or write in, email in, whatever, or argue with us on our on our wall or whatever, or, or my Facebook wall. Anyway, the first one that uh, actually three of these people I also kind of thought of, and although one I didn't know by name. Um, first one we thought of was, of course, Rachel Louise Carson, the, the mother of the modern environmentalist movement. Um, hey. Rachel was, yeah, she, she was a marine biologist. Uh, she wrote three books, Silent Spring, the 1951 bestseller, uh, The Sea Around Us and Under the Sea Wind, like trilogy there. Uh, she was born in 1907 and lived till 1964, two years before I was born, uh, born in Springdale, Pennsylvania. Uh, her lifelong partner was apparently, or for much of her life, was Dorothy Freeman, uh, who also wrote a book called Always Rachel, which is like a compilation of her letters while she was doing her writing. And uh, apparently they're, they're very beautiful and poetic, edited by uh, Dorothy's daughter, Martha Freeman. Um, Rachel went to Chatham University and Johns Hopkins. Um, she apparently started her career working for the U.S. Bureau of Fish and Wildlife, but uh, uh, by about 1952, I believe I saw she was uh, she was pretty much a full time writer. Um, her work led to the banning of DDT and the creation of the EPA, and she also won the Presidential Medal of Freedom for her work. <laughs> So, wow. yeah, always worth a read there. The second one, That's Jane great. Goodall, yeah. I thought of also. Well, just two quick things. One, so are you saying Rachel's number one or number four? I don't know. I think number one, because she's the first person I thought of. Okay. All right. So, I, and I, I would concur. I, I'd put her at number one. And uh, just a quick reminder that if she hadn't pushed for the ban of DDT, uh, right now, humans would be having incredible reproductive problems uh, because yeah. that, that was a really nasty chemical in the environment. So, okay, number two. Because we eat all that stuff that, 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 that was getting affected earlier. <laughs> That's right. the problem with being the top of the food chain. So, yeah, number two, Jane Goodall. I read her books and loved them as a child and an adolescent. Uh, she's an English primatologist and anthropologist who did a 60-year study of the chimpanzees in uh, Gombe National Park in Tanzania. I think it's technically Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania and is the foremost world expert on chimpanzees. Uh, she was born in London in 1934, went to Newham College and Darwin College in Cambridge. Uh, her mother is actually an author named Van Morris Goodall. V-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E. Never heard of her, but now I kind of want to read her. Um, she was, uh, Jane Goodall was heavily, heavily influenced by Lois Leakey. I think she had some kind of secretarial job or something in Africa. So she, uh, she, she called Lois Leakey 
uh, because she just wanted to talk about animals <laughs> because she liked them. And he was like, well, why don't you go to get college and get several advanced degrees and then go to Africa and spend a few decades studying chimpanzees? And she thought this was a good idea. <laughs> well, it didn't start out that way. Nobody knew it was going to, you know, go on that long and everything. But yeah, she, she, uh, she's one of the, she's the first person to prove that chimpanzees had rational thought, emotion, family bonds, tool use, and meat eating. And uh, she's currently a board member of the, oh, Non-Human Rights Project. There we go. Yeah. So, and we know, you know, non-human rights, the concept is uh, getting on in the world. I even came, kind of came to Toledo in, in, uh, in the form of our LIBOR regulations. Yeah. So, yeah. I actually, I actually met Jane Goodall once at an event oh. in Buffalo. And uh, oh, extremely Jan. gracious. Yes, extremely oh, gracious. Doubt. Yeah. Very, she seemed like a, just she as seemed nice, nice as you think she might be. She's a little nicer than yeah. that, actually. So, oh my gosh, wow, cool, <laughs> right? So, our our number three was Greta Thunberg. Thunberg, um, she was born in uh, two thousand and three in Stockholm. She's written four books. Uh, she she became an activist for climate change in twenty eighteen. Um, apparently, let's see, Greta has autism and is uh, his selective mutism which according to her means she only she only talks when she got something to say <laughs> not like me for not like people who become radio hosts um <laughs> right but uh apparently when she was about 11 she learned about climate change and was so upset she got very very depressed and stopped eating for a couple of months her parents did not want her to do activism and miss time from school, but uh, it seemed preferable to her not eating. So they, they started letting her stand outside the Swedish parliament every morning with a sign saying school strike for climate change. And uh, let's see, she's won. That's her main thing is the school strike for ch climate change. And uh, she's won the International Children's Peace Prize, been nominated a couple times for a Nobel uh, Time Person of the Year and the Rachel Carson Prize. What do you know? <laughs> Ah, and uh it all together yeah cool her parents interestingly are are a uh an, an actor and an opera singer and her grandpa is some sort of film director or something hmm. so they sound yeah, like interesting I, people <laughs> yeah I'd, I'd love to get her on the show sometime but uh we'll see if that ever it's happens. kind of interesting I, I, that she comes from such you know sort of artistic creative people and she herself seems very very nuts and bolts you know and yet I guess she was born into the right family who, who got her. <laughs> mm -hmm. So now, number four. Number four, we decided it was going to be Lois Gibbs. She's an American. Uh, I think she was maybe just a housewife to begin with. But uh, she's, she's, uh, she was a, she's a member of the Love Canals Home, Homeowner Association. Uh, born in 1951, became 1978. Uh, her work on Love Canal issues uh, led to, the, to 800 families being evacuated, which the government was not going to do. It was just going to leave them there. And uh, she works with the Center, Center for Health Center. Department and Justice. Sorry, right. my camera is really bad right. today. Yeah. She's the author of a book, uh, Dying from Dioxin, uh, Love Canal, The Story Continues. So I, I like her title there. She just went ahead and said, called it Dying from Dioxin. Well, she she, uh, she didn't yeah. bury the lead at all. <laughs> but yeah, I guess, no, you know, no she started doing this. person. Right. She started doing this because her son, she learned uh, from the work of Michael H. Brown, the journalist, that her son's elementary school in Niagara was built on a toxic waste dump. And it eventually emerged that her entire subdevelopment had, in fact, been built on a toxic waste dump. And uh, so, you know, with no environmentalist training whatsoever, she just got out and, and started circulating a petition. And uh, I guess her work led to the creation of the Superfund program of the EPA. And uh, I guess the, her, the center she works with um, pretty much just educates activists, like trains people to do activism work, which we really need more people doing that. You know, that, right. that's a lot of environmental activism is not the glamorous being trained to trees stuff. It's kind of the very boring nuts and bolts grind of it, <laughs> which right. I, I uh, yeah, that's and what she... really needs doing more than anything. And she has been a guest on our show, so just uh, go Excellent. back and check our check our uh, YouTube version and our podcast on Podomatic, and uh, you can see we we did a, a beautiful interview with with Lois Gibbs. All right, all right, well, uh, and and that thank viewers, you very much, Rebecca. Give us our number five. Call in and listeners, and <laughs> we'll okay. nominate somebody. 
<laughs> well, my my number five, okay, was uh-huh. uh, Ellen Swallow Richards, who was oh, nice. the the first woman in the U.S. who was accepted to a, a scientific college. And what Ooh. she did is she invented <clears throat> modern water clarity standards, water cleanliness standards, because she brought scientific principles to uh, water quality and led to the whole development of sewage treatment technology. Because back That seems uh, like a valuable contribution. <laughs> it is, because back in those late 1800s, it seems obvious to us now, but back then they didn't put together the idea that, oh, you put sewage into the lake and then you take drinking water out of the lake. And that's they a never problem. Made the, the, <laughs> until she came along with her scientific research and showed, you know, that means you're drinking sewage. <laughs> Right, yeah, because, which uh, but, seems like common so, sense, but apparently nobody had thought of it. Uh, if you go right. on those those uh, if you go on those tours of the where you get to go on a, a canal boat in, down in Grand Rapids, um, you know, with a, with a, pulled by mules and everything, they one of the things they tell you is that uh, as a precaution against disease, uh, people used to get their throw their throw their uh, throw their thunder mug as they put it uh, off of one side of the boat and then um, get their drinking water from the entire other side of the boat <laughs> right because so, they're separated yeah so somehow ellen they had swallow- a cholera epidemic in spite of that no one knows why <laughs> oh, gosh. Yep. ellen swallow <laughs> richards was her name that's yeah. that's my number five so she's all right. the one well, who yeah, pointed out that was a bad idea she was i mean she was smart enough to do that at a time when uh, no one else seemed to be so okay Indeedy. ellen swallow richards all right thanks rebecca cool. now Racing on to environmental news, and we've got a ton of it. Okay. Uh, one breaking and extremely timely story, which I'm sorry that our listeners in Columbus aren't going to hear this too late to do anything about it, but uh, the Senate has introduced something called Senate Bill 52, SB 52, and it is a bill designed to eliminate a winded solar power in the state of Ohio completely by uh, adding this... Uh, final layer of uh, barricades to developing wind and solar. Right now, you've got to go, if you want to put in a wind plant or solar plant, you got to navigate this huge maze of laws and restrictions they've put in place. But if you manage to do that, uh, then you can put up wind and solar, and, and there are some projects going on, even though it's incredibly difficult in Ohio, much more difficult than any other state. But so they, so the legislature said, huh, some are still getting through. So they created this SB 52, and what it would do is create is say that there has to be a local referendum for any proposed wind or solar power project in the state of Ohio. And so that means, for example, if you have a wind project which covers uh, three counties, you have to have a referendum and it has to pass in every single township in all three counties or the whole project can get axed. And, and and the Republicans are, are justifying, quote unquote, justifying this by saying, oh, we're giving back local control. And that would be a lot more believable if they weren't at the same time, the very same legislators blocking local control for passing pro-environmental laws like bannings of plastic bags or, or stricter environmental standards. So these same guys, most of them are guys, are blocking local control to protect the environment but now they're trying to use local control to prevent clean energy from getting built. And you might say, oh, Joe, but it is local control, except I have to point out they're only doing this with wind and solar. They're not proposing, yeah, yeah. Lo- yeah, not proposing local referendums for, uh, for refineries or nuclear plants or trash incinerators or, or pipelines or any other thing which might affect uh, the environment and which might people might in a local region say hey we don't want that uh no instead and guess who's got more money to pay for advertising to push their side in a local referendum right and we saw that with hb6 where they got uh 65 million dollars of uh, bribes and kickbacks and so forth from uh first energy in order to pr- to put out tons of super false 100 percent false of information about uh the House Bill 6 law. And of course, you know, if they have $100 million to put out the false stuff, uh, you're going to take, you're going to need tens of millions to counter that with the truth. 
And to add that on top of all the other blockades they've already got in place, uh, Ohio, if this passes, will not see any more wind or solar development. It's, it's diabolical. So uh, there is a chance to still make comments. I urge everyone to go to the Ohio Citizen Action website. And we have, they, they opened up comments for about a week. You get to make public comments on this. Uh, Tuesday is the last day for making, or no, Monday, excuse me, Monday afternoon at four. So if you want to make a comment on this and tell them don't do it, you have till tomorrow, 4 p.m. Uh, and go to the Ohio Citizen Action website to see how to do that. All right, now, uh, next, House Bill 6 update. <sighs> so, House Bill 6, as, as you know, <laughs> this story so far has had almost everything. It's had uh, bribery, it's had corruption, it's had huge public scandals, it's had billions of dollars getting uh, shifted out of state to shady, crooked investors from New York City. Uh, what's the one thing, do you think, Rebecca, that this story has been lacking. Just if you had to pick something, if this was a made-for-TV movie, what would be the one There's thing that's missing? Some sort of missing? a sex scandal, Joe. It needs a sex scandal. Ah, sex scandal. Well, that's a good one. Yeah, you're right. I, then that's probably on the way. I don't know. But the, what, <laughs> yeah, what, they, what, what it does now have is a uh, mysterious death associated that with it. That, too. That's, that's yes. exciting also, yeah. Yeah. Neil Clark who was an indicted co-conspirator conspirator with Householder, Larry Householder, uh, has been found dead in a park in Florida with his 2019 Lincoln Town Car parked nearby. Uh, he's Richie. been shot. Yep. Oh and, and he uh, was, as I said, indicted with, for the, in this huge bribery scandal. He's maintained his innocence, but... Uh, as a result of the indictment, he has been a lobbyist. He's been a lobbyist for pretty much every big business in the state of Ohio has used him as a lobbyist at some point. Uh, he has been such a ubiquitous figure. He's sometimes been called the unofficial senator because he's always there. He's got his yeah. hands in everybody's pocket and everybody. Do we need uh, unofficial senators, Joe? <laughs> no, I like. I just have the, the official ones. I, I like the elected by ones. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, I prefer the elected ones. But uh, he supposedly had just written and was about to publish a, a tell-all book about his whole history in dirty politics in the state of Ohio. And, uh, oh, my. And now he's been mysteriously found dead in Florida. What a coincidence. Yeah, the... Uh, <laughs> The autopsy report has not been released yet, but uh, it's safe to say that this guy, he knows where all the bodies are, so to speak, because he's the one who brought the shovel. So, um, wow. So, it, if this tell all book gets published, uh, heads may well roll in the state of Ohio. We'll see. Wow. All right. So, so that was an important story to get out. Neil Clark is his name, and it's probably the first time you've heard of him, and it's a testament to his uh, success and anonymity, his behind the scenes uh, acting because he's been involved in almost every big anti-environmental uh, motion in the state in for the past 20 years or so in the state of Ohio. So he's quite the guy, but now he's uh, passed on. Real quick, just wanted to mention Washington Post had a story about how the uh, CO2 levels were not uh, did not level off or uh, decline because of the reduction in human produced CO2 because the fires in the tundra had made up for it. And I just wanted to say yeah. you know, it's almost exactly the same story we reported last Sunday. Yeah. What <laughs> so, a coincidence. Uh, too slow, yeah. Washington Post. Too slow. We, we beat <laughs> you to that one. Um, now, the uh, caribou, unfortunately, are in decline, very steep decline right uh -oh. now. And uh, there's been a number of fig studies to try to figure out why. They Again, as they always historically tried to do, tried to blame the wolves. But uh, it turns out that there was a, in physics.org, physics phy.org, uh, there's a study done that shows that the culprit is cutting down 
the boreal forest. The the tan. Oh yeah. Because, because they as we mentioned depend- earlier in our my report about caribou, they like to hang out there. <laughs> right. They eat moss. So, oh, lichens, lichens. Sorry, lichens. Right. They eat the lichen in that forest, and so what happens when you cut those forests down? which Canada is doing at a very high rate in order to supply us with toilet paper and stuff. Um, when you cut those down, uh, it, it creates this uh, chain reaction of other plants moving in, things like uh, shrubs and, and annuals, plants that are better suited to be eaten by moose and deer. And mm. the increased moose and deer population causes the wolf population to swell. And so you not only take away the food and the habitat for the caribou, but you fill in with other animals that outcompete them for that kind of food and that cause a surge in the wolf population, which can cause increased predation on the caribou. So yeah. so the basic problem is cutting down the forest that the caribou depend on. Oh, shoot, we're almost out of time. I uh, just wanted to say real quick, the Vogtel. Three uh, reactors, nuclear reactors, uh, funded by President Obama uh, back in 2009, have announced once again they're going to miss their next uh, deadline for starting up. That officially puts them uh, 30 billion dollars instead of 14 billion estimate, and uh, so far 13 years of construction instead of the five years that was predicted, and billions. They can miss all the deadlines as far as we're concerned. Yeah, the real tragedy is if they ever do manage to actually start up. That's the real tragedy. So let's hope that never happens. All right, we're out of time. All right, this is Joe Damar. We are. And Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off. No more three-headed frogs. More kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit 